So this is more of um, a traditional talk. Um, what's also traditional is that we're running late already, even after the first talk. Absolutely fine. No, no, that's sort of expected. That's more of the nature of this kind of meeting. Um, I'll have a traditional State of the Union talk. Um, a big part of that is looking at the results of the Easy Build User Survey, which we've been doing for a couple of years now. We've got more and more people to join the survey, even though people do need a reminder to fill out the survey. Um, but it's still, it's still going up in terms of uh, participants. That's very good. Um, if you want to see the full survey results in raw, like without much interpretation or, or text around it, they're already in the Easy Build documentation. You can find them in there. Um, you'll see most of them here, but not everything. Um, and of course, in the survey, there is always a bit of bias, like the people who don't like to fill out the survey are not there. Um, so to some extent, we do assume that this gives an, an, uh, a good view of the Easy Build community, but we, sh we shouldn't assume everything is fully correct. And that actually pops up. All right, so primary profile of people. Um, the, big, the biggest part of people are considered as system administrators. Second, big, second biggest group is user support. Um, sysadmins are going up a bit more. Maybe sysadmins were less busy and had time to fill out the survey. I'm not sure. Um, if you, this, this same question is being asked in the SPAC survey as well, and there it's very, very different. There you have a, a bigger shift towards researchers and scientists and scientific software developers. Here it's more sysadmins and user support. Um, and that's more because of the nature of the, of the tool, so that's not really unexpected. Um, types of organization, this is maybe a bit less interesting. Um, it's very non-sexy in terms of, of trends, so not much going on here. Um, geographical, mostly in Europe, no surprise. Um, is it too close? Yeah, okay. Let me know if it keeps happening. Um, yeah, so mostly Europe, not a surprise. Again, if you would look at the SPAC results, those would be very different. It would be very US focused. Uh, so we are um, two different tools, two different communities in terms of geographical, in terms of uh, expertise of people, in terms of role, um, it is very good. How long have people been using EasyBuild? Well, for quite a while. The people who are, have been using EasyBuild for 10 years and more are starting to pop up. Um, so people seem to be sticking around, even though it, it depends a bit on the of these results. Can I ask? Um, what this does? The microphone is very, very poor. The one okay. which Ian had beforehand was a lot better. The one you are using is very, very poor. Sorry to jump in, but... Uh... And I'll turn off this guy. How does that sound, Simon? Much Are you better. picking me up now? Much better, a bit too high. Yeah, sounds good. Okay, I'll, I'll talk for a while. And if, if it's not okay, Simon will tell me. This is gonna look ridiculous, but okay. I can live with that. Um, so how long have people been using EasyBuild? Yeah, EasyBuild has been around for 10 plus years and that's starting to show. Um, what's interesting here is that you still see a pretty steady influx of, um, of new people. So about 20% of the current community Based on the survey, based on the survey, is new to the community in the last year. So we keep having new people coming in. Um, that's very good, um, and it's very important to be aware of that as well. Like people are new, people are not fully aware of how things are are done in EasyBuild, what our policies are. Uh, maybe they uh, they still need a bit of training and so on. So it's important to, to be aware of this. Um, this also shows a bit here. How do people first learn about EasyBuild? Um, Word of mouth is still the biggest thing. People uh, see a tutorial or hear someone talking about it or get a recommendation. Um, but more and more people, and that's the red line here and the red part in the graph, are picking up EasyBuild on the job. So they're starting in a, in a new job. EasyBuild is being used there, so they're, they're being told to also use EasyBuild there. Um, and that's a big, a big part of the influx of new people that we have. OK, um, so last year was a, a special year for EasyBuild. Um, EasyBuild was first publicly released in 2012, um, and we also had the, uh, the version 1.0 release in November 2012. Um, so of course, we wanted to do something special around that. Um, 
also the community has been growing since we made it public. So we started quite small with these hackathon meetings. And I think at the very first hackathon, we had one person outside the HPC Ghent team, that was Fotis, who came to Ghent and had a discussion of where this thing should be going or could be going. Um, and since then, we've been growing, we've been doing hackathons, we've been using meetings like this, two of them virtual, not by choice. Um, we've had sessions at IC and SE and so on. Um, we did have cake at some point as well. It was actually a five-year cake. I cheated a bit and made it a 10-year cake. I'm very bad at Photoshop, I'm sorry. Um, so yeah, this, this celebration, we didn't let it, we didn't want to go unnoticed. So what we did, one thing is uh, introduce a new EasyBuild logo. Well, the old one is on the top left. It looks like a child drew it. It wasn't a child. It was a Belgian person after a couple of years. Um, so it looks a bit maybe unprofessional. Um, so it made sense to us to try and do a better job at that. Um, so that's what the logo on the right has become. There was actually a graphics designer who was involved in this, and there was a lot of back and forth, a lot of iteration. Um, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. With the right tools, it could still be done by a child. That's true. But it does have a lot of, of layers, and it, it has a good connection with EasyBuild. There was a, there's a write-up on the EasyBuild website as well. The link is there. And that explains a bit about why it looks like the way it looks. And to me, at least, it makes sense. Um, we also asked in the survey, how do people like it? The majority seems to be at least OK with it or better. So I, I think we're quite happy with it. Um, it's very difficult to create a logo that everybody loves. That would be impossible, but I think we did a, as good of a, as a job as we could. And some people just don't like change, right? So you can never make everybody happy. Um, I also did an easy build into a new decade talk that looked back at the history of easy build, how things came to be, um, how have we've been going from in-house development to public release and beyond that, the start of the community, all the features that were developed that we would have never thought of ourselves. Um, so thanks to having a community, EasyBuild has changed and improved a lot. We've learned a lot of things um, and we've been looking forward to uh, new challenges like EasyBuild version five, the Easy project and so on. Uh, the pictures show a bit uh, the growth of the community. The one at the top is one of the first um, EasyBuild meetings we had outside of Belgium, which was in Cyprus. Again, Fortis was very much involved with this. He has a boat there, he has friends there. So he wanted to have a meeting there and it sort of happened. Um, the one at the bottom is the last EasyBuild user meeting we had, the physical one, at least in Barcelona, which is now three years ago. Um, so that was 50 plus people. That was quite big. Uh, slides and recording of that are available. So if you want to check that talk, it's all there. Okay, then back to some of the survey results. Um, so one thing that, that Ian focused on a lot is hardware. But the software part of, of all of that is very important as well. And not only the software that's actually running, the scientific software, but the environment in which it's running is, is important as well. Uh, the biggest um, thing there is the operating system. Um, in the EasyBuild community, and I'm sort of treating this as, as a proxy to the HPC community, which is a big stretch, but um, there are at least some, um, some trends there that probably map over quite well. Um, the biggest OS is anything Red Hat based, so RHEL. CentOS, um, Rocky Linux, Alma Linux, all these things. Um, CentOS 7 is going down, but actually pretty slowly, especially if you know that its end of life is mid next year, um, there's still about 50% of the EasyBuild community using this as an operating system. So that's, that's quite in, extensive. I doubt that will go to zero by summer next year. That's just not gonna happen. Um, and this is actually important for us to realize because a lot of the testing we do in EasyBuild in terms of contributions, we're actually doing that in Rocky 8 or RHEL or CentOS 8. We're not actively testing in CentOS 7 anymore. So that's something we need to be a bit more careful with. Um, at least for the next two years or so, CentOS 7 is still gonna be relevant. We should still care about it. For the people who are transitioning away from CentOS 7, it looks like Rocky 8 or Rocky 9 is the, is the choice that they're going with. Some people have RHEL 8, RHEL 9, so the commercial, the more expensive. Um, version of that is, uh, is basically what's taking over. There's very little Alma Linux being picked up in the EasyBuild community. I think that's true for the larger HPC community as well. So next to anything Red Hat based, there's other stuff as well. There's Ubuntu, there's Debian. Yeah, Bart already has a, a question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so apparently CERN has picked Alma Linux as the replacement for CentOS. I've heard about that, but 
they may be, I'm not sure what made them go for Alma rather than Rocky. They did an extensive study and yeah, they did a lot of in-house work on that and they went with Alma in the end. I'm not sure why, but it looks like they're going against stream here for stream. Faster updates was one of the, one of the aspects. Yeah, could be. Um, yeah, so CentOS or anything Red Hat based is all over the place. Um, there's other operating systems as well. So the ones on the right are Ubuntu, the stable releases of Ubuntu, 2004 and 2204. They're like very tiny, which doesn't mean we shouldn't care about them, but at least our most of our efforts are geared towards Red Hat based stuff and the sites who are using Ubuntu and some people are here. Yeah, like Oka and Alexandra, Ulrich as well, uh, John and, and um, at Fred Hutch. I'm not, I don't want to say you're on your own, but you're, yeah, you're making yourself a, a, a bit more difficult than you maybe should. Uh, now, you probably have reasons to pick this and we're, we're still going to properly support this. And Ubuntu 2204, there's this issue with the Python packages that get installed in the subdirectory. So these OS specific things happen and we'll deal with it some, some way or another. Um, there's other operating systems as well, which I'm not even mentioning here. It's less, so anything SUSE based. Um, they're sub 5% in the community, at least based on the survey. Then somewhat tied to the operating system is the Python versions being used. We're finally seeing Python 2.7 dying. So it's, it's really dropping off a cliff like it should be. Um, so the end of life of Python 2 was actually end of 2020, which is already, let's say two and a half years ago. And now finally people are starting to stop using it. That's very good. Um, so Easy Build has supported running on top of Python 3 since Easy Build 4, which is, I don't know, two years old. Um, and there's a very easy way to switch it to running uh, on top of Python 3 if you have it installed in your operating system. So please do. Um, running Easy Build on top of Python 2.7 still works, but it's deprecated. You'll get a big fat warning about it. Um, and we're going to actively stop supporting Python 2 in the upcoming Easy Build 5. Um, Supporting Python 3.6 is still important because that's the default Python in CentOS 8 and anything RHEL 8 based. We're going to keep that and probably keep that for a couple of years, whether we like it or not. Um, the community seems to be okay with that. So more and more people are saying, I don't really care if you drop Python 2 support. So um, right now we're, we're in a quite good state to actually start doing that. And that's probably going to happen by the end of the year when we have easy build five. Uh, oh yeah, in the documentation, it, it explains you how you can easily switch um, the EB wrapper script to tell it to use a particular version of Python. So please make sure you're doing that and that you're no longer using Python 2. Then um, another question in the survey, are you using easy build on a top 500 system? Um, that helps us a bit in terms of getting an idea of, of on which big systems easy build is being used. The list is there. I'm not going to go through all of them. Most of them are not a surprise to us. We, we kind of know that those are easy build sites. Um, Lumi is definitely the biggest one here. Um, so Kurt gave a talk on that last year and is gonna give us an update uh, uh, during this meeting as well. Yeah, if we would count in, 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 in flops, so in, in compute power, then SUSE is, yeah, is really big in the easy build community because of Lumi, yeah. Yeah, but we're not. I mean, yeah, also in Ulich, I think it's still less based. Is that still the case? Or is it? It's all CentOS, okay. And Ubuntu, yeah. Um, so what, what's interesting here, um, so 25% of people said they are using EasyBuild on a top 500 system. That means three quarters of the community is not doing that, is using EasyBuild on smaller systems. Um, and I, I'm not sure if SPAC has a, has a question on this in their survey. I think for them, it would be very different. I think the balance between big and small systems there would be, would be very different. So maybe easy build caters more to smaller sites. I'm not sure. Um, processor families. So this, this ties in with Ian's talk a little bit at least. Um, Skylake is still the king as far as we can tell. Um, it's about 55% uh, of people have at least one Skylake system. Um, what's really funny and painful is that Haswell and Brother are still there and 30% and of HPC sites is still running Haswell and Broadwell. 
So it's basically as long as they have the, the floor space and as long as they can pay for the electricity, they're keeping these things running. Um, even Sandy Bridge, yeah. So Sandy Bridge is the green line that's at about, let's say 20%. And there's a box for older, so older than Sandy Bridge, that's the orange line that's now still at around 10%. So people are keeping really ancient systems still running, 10 years, something like that, and they're keeping it going. Um, that's also important for us, right? We, we don't have to assume everyone has AVX 512, even assuming AVX2 is already a stretch, at least for some people. So I'm not sure what they are being used for, but that's uh, that's interesting. Sapphire Rapids, it, there's a blip there, but nobody basically has it yet, not a surprise. Uh, so that's all Intel processors. Then looking at others, non-Intel, of course, AMD is a big one here. Um, AMD Rome, so Zen 2 is over 40% currently in the easy build community. Milan is picking up speed very quickly, is now at about uh, a third of the community. So that's looking very interesting. Um, anything else, so anything non x86 is pretty much nowhere, at least today. Um, so it's all at 5% or less. Um, so power, we don't have a lot of power users, no surprise there, but also ARM, I was actually expecting this to be picking up a bit quicker. I think that's going to change a lot with the, with the NVIDIA Gray CPU, which is ARM. That's really going to change things. So two, let's say two years from now, this is going to, this graph is going to look like a, it's going to look a lot different, I think. Um, and that's again a concern for easy build. We'll have to actively start testing on ARM CPUs to make sure stuff works. And that's going to complicate our work quite a bit. Risk five is not here yet. There's no Risk five uh, capable CPUs. Maybe on a five year horizon that will change as well. We'll see what happens. Then accelerators, um, also here, no surprise, NVIDIA is king. Um, about 65% of people have Ampere A30 or A100 GPUs, basically the most powerful GPUs you can get from NVIDIA. Currently, that makes sense. Um, the V100, the Voltas are there for about half the people who filled out the survey, and that's stagnant, so it's not dropping off. People are keeping those systems, probably will keep them for a couple of years. Um, Older generations like Pascal are still there, about 30%. So they're, they're keeping them. Uh, and the Kepler ones are really starting to disappear. So there, in terms of energy consumption, probably doesn't make sense anymore um, to keep running those. Anything non-NVIDIA is again, well, that's not on this slide yet. It actually is. I didn't add the graph here because there was no point. It's so small that it just it's in the noise. So AMD GPUs, again, flop-wise, it would be very different. But in terms of number of people who are installing software for AMD GPUs with EasyBuild, there were like a, a small blip, one, two, three percent. Yeah. So the, typically the bigger sites like Lumi and Yulik are, but nobody else is. And yeah, the, the smaller NVIDIA GPUs are there. It's going up and down a bit. So it depends a bit on the... Uh, on what the market is uh, is doing and how interesting it is to buy these. All right. Um, another thing we did in the in the last year is revamp the EasyBuild documentation. We've been talking about this for a couple of years, maybe two user meetings, uh, possibly three, at least floating the idea. Um, what we wanted to do was migrate our documentation to a markdown format to the MK Docs tool. Um, because at least I'm very convinced that that will make contributing to the documentation significantly easier. And I think we, we're already starting to see that where more people are, are uh, at least uh, starting to help out with the documentation. Um, has some very interesting features, a very nice search in the render documentation is one of them. There's others as well. It's very actively uh, developed MK Docs. So they're making enhancements and improvements and new features all the time. Um, and they have a very special open source development model, they do sponsor where, where as a user, you can say, I'm going to sponsor the project. And that gives you a um, preview of the new features coming up and like the, the sole right to start using these features months ahead of everybody else. And they do ask you not to share the code because it's open source. And if you give a copy of that code to someone else, they can do the same thing um, if they're also using MK Docs. And somehow that works. Um, so even though some of these new features or the code for that is, is leaking into uh, people who are not sponsoring, somehow it still works. So that's a very interesting approach. Um, the effort on all this was started in October 2022 uh, by setting up a dedicated repository for the documentation. 
copying all the, the documentation in the restructured text format in there and then starting to port it gradually uh, onto Markdown. Um, we also moved from read the docs to GitHub pages. So we have everything in GitHub that made a bit more sense. Um, a lot of the porting effort was actually done by Simon. Simon, raise your hand here in front. And James, where's James? James is in the back. If you run into these people this week, buy them a beer or buy them two beers because they've been really doing all the work in terms of porting and in a, in a pretty short amount of time. Um, so that whole effort, including switching uh, docs.easybolt.io to the new uh, documentation was done in, in January. What we made very sure of is that we didn't break any existing URLs. So we have a mailing list, we have Slack, we have GitHub, um, uh, lots of comments in there with pointers to the documentation. All those links should still work, even though we moved to a totally different platform, a totally different tool. So we were very careful uh, not to break those URLs. So this is what it looks like. The one on the left is the old one, um, which hurts my eyes currently. The one on the right is the current documentation, the dark view. Um, of that, which looks a lot better. The structure is a lot better as well. It's probably way easier to find stuff if you're looking for it, at least to, I hope it is. And if it's not, we're gonna improve it a lot uh, as we can. Um, the search feature is, is really good and they're actively working on it in MKDocs to even make it better. So you can tag individual pages and more guide people using the search feature to specific pages if you want to. Um, there's a light and a dark mode. Um, I, I use the dark mode always because that attracts less bugs. Um, but some people do use the, the light mode. Um, and overall, this seems to be um, uh, received quite well uh, for the people that have made up their mind or have looked at it enough to form an opinion. Um, it's mostly positive and there's only a very small part that says, I like the old documentation better. Um, they're welcome to, to help out with the new documentation, of course. Yeah. Sure. Revise the color teams to make them more accessible. Okay, yeah, then, then there's something we should we should check for. Not enough contrast in the current. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's very important. To... Yeah, yeah. No, that's a that's a, that's a very good suggestion. We should keep an eye on that. Um, We've, we've actually done some of that already, but probably not far enough or, uh, and I guess there's tools also that help you to, that, that give you scoring or gives you. Uh... Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah we... yeah, we should look at some of those tools to improve the, the color scheme, yeah. Okay, so this whole effort is 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 not the end. It's actually only a starting point, at least it is to me. Um, so this is was like a necessary evil, getting rid of this old format that wasn't really um, helpful um, for contributors. Um, that was just the first step. Uh, we now want to actively start filling up the gaps in the existing documentation, restructure some of the documentation, like the writing easy configs page is huge, has way too much detail. It should be, uh, at least the landing page of that should be way more basic and point you to other places if you want more specific information. So break it up into smaller pages. Um, we should actually update the documentation when we implement new stuff. We're not doing that often enough. So we are making enhancements, but the people are not using them uh, because they don't know it's there. Um, we've kickstarted a yearly review cycle of the documentation. What we wanna do is have someone look at every page um, looking if it's still up to date, if it has parts that are missing or that are just totally outdated. We found some of them already um, and actually doing an update of that page. Um, we think with enough helping hands, we can do that in the scope of a year and then keep doing it every year over and over again. The first one is gonna be the painful one because we're hitting things that are still claiming they are relevant for Easy Build 2, which has been gone for six, seven years or something. Um, but yeah, I think this is an important thing as well. Yeah. Another remark? Um, can we automate the, the, the review cycle? So what we're doing now is we're creating an issue for each page that says this page should be reviewed. If it's reviewed, the issue is closed. The next year we can basically reopen the issue and just keep going like this. So yeah, I'm, to some extent we can probably automate it as well if we want. 
Um, and that's actually going to my next point. We actually want to engage more contributors for this because this type of work is very different from, from coding or reviewing easy configs, testing easy configs. It's more technical, technical writing um, and really seeing if it makes sense. What is there? Does it make sense? Um, does it need to be explained better or does it have gaps? Um, so we're hoping to attract new people and maybe dedicated documentation maintainers for, for this type of thing next to the current maintainers that we already have. Another thing is we should probably also collapse the easy build tutorial, which is now a totally separate site, but also using MKDocs. You should collapse that into the documentation. So if you're searching the documentation, you're also hitting parts of the tutorial. It's now totally separate and that doesn't really make sense. Um, so if you would like to be involved in that, we have a dedicated docs channel in the easy build Slack. Please join there. Um, and we should probably do a semi-regular meeting on, on the documentation itself as well. Maybe once every two months or something a bit less frequent than the other stuff we have, just to, to check what the big, the big next step is that we could take. Uh, there's also the easy build tutorial. Um, like I said, it's now a totally separate website. We've had an official easy build tutorial at ISC last year, which was pretty much the same setup that we had the year before. Um, the year before that, we did a fully uh, online tutorial because of the pandemic. Um, so that's been going on for a couple of years now. We did a submission for ISC 23, which was not accepted. It's not entirely clear to us why. It looks like it was more competitive than previous years. It looks like we, we got very close to being accepted, but there was one reviewer who was strongly worded enough and gave us a low score enough that we just dropped out. Yeah, they also shrunk the amount of space that's available for tutorials, so there's actually less people yeah, yeah. Maybe we we are yeah we're the victim of that. It's not clear. Yeah. Um, so yeah, if we don't have an ISC tutorial, we're just looking for other opportunities. We're actually doing an easy build plus easy introductory workshop at the end of this week as well, Thursday and Friday, mostly focused on UK sites. So it's a small group. It's, we have we only have twenty seats. Uh, we're not planning to do live streaming of that, but we are going to try and record it and just make it available through the easy build. Um, YouTube channel afterwards. Uh, so that's an introduction to easy build, some advanced topics, and then also a half day introduction to the easy project, which Casper will tell us more about tomorrow, I think. Yeah. Um, next to this, we could maybe again do a fully free online easy build tutorial, maybe with a small part on easy later this year in June around ISC or shortly after that. Um, or later in 2023. When we did this in 2020, but 2020 is a bad year to compare with. That was a very interesting year. Um, we had over 100 registrations back then. So by doing it fully online, you, you can reach a lot of people, of course. So maybe we should just redo that again if we, did, if we don't get the opportunity to do it at ISC. Um, are people aware of the Easy Build community? Most are, but a big portion of them had no idea there was an Easy Build tutorial. Um, so we should do more to promote it, like I'm doing now. Um, and yeah, have people work through the tutorial. There's, there's a whole um, variety there of answers. Some people check the recording. Some people go purely on the website, which has exercises. Um, so people are not interesting or, or not, not interested or, or don't think they would learn anything. Yeah, that all makes sense. Then in terms of supported software for easy build, we're about to break. Um, uh, the threshold of having 3000 unique software packages so without versions um, supported that's getting really scary um, and that's not counting extensions so python packages that get installed as a group of or or on top of something else so if you combine those then we have about 5000 unique software projects that we currently support um, and that line keeps going up and if you check closely especially the last three releases it's actually tilting a bit it's picking up the pace so there seems to be some AI effect there maybe where more people are starting to produce tools because AI is cool and they're using PyTorch as a dependency or they're depending on something else that uses PyTorch and basically making the stack of dependencies a lot deeper. So we see a lot of that going, going on. Uh, we see requests for new installation uh, for new software being installed all the time coming in. With, I think it's even half the requests we get are for new software packages which is getting, uh, getting really scary. Yeah, John. How does that compare to SPAC in terms of speed of, I have no idea. But, 
Yeah. Yes, yeah. So they, they do all extensions, count them separately. Um, yeah, yeah. That's something we see in Easy Build as well. Yeah. 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 So for the people remote, for the people remote, in terms of raw numbers, spec is about 7,000, which should be compared with the 5,000 we have here. So it's maybe slightly lower. Um, there's actually a paper, I should, I should have mentioned this. There's a research paper from, um, which was sponsored by the Chan Zuckerberg Foundation. So the, the Facebook people essentially, um, which did data mining on research papers and looked at how many software projects they could find. Now it's, it's a language model and it's AI and they're extracting tokens from papers and then creating a list. I think the number they came up with was 40,000 unique software projects. So we're not even scratching the, the surface on that. It's insane. I'm not sure how accurate that number is, but I wouldn't, let's say if it's half that, then we're still only hitting like 20, 25% of all software out there, which is research software. So not talking about other software. Um, so to some extent, that's a bit depressing <laughs> with all the effort that we're doing. There's still a lot more to come and it's only going to get worse in the years ahead. So it, it's becoming more and more easy for scientists to produce software, to publish it through GitHub. There's also pressure to publish their software along with their papers. And then other people are more easily picking up on it. So it just snowballs like that. So. Yeah. Why? Yeah. So the comment was PyPy has 300,000 packages. I'm not sure a lot of the, a lot of those are not going to be relevant to us, but yeah, in terms of uh, ballpark figures, that's scary. Yeah. 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 So yeah, this is, this is not going to end anytime soon. New stuff will keep coming in and we'll need a good way of, of dealing with that. Um, this, this was a bit interesting and maybe a bit of a surprise. So the question in the survey was, are end users using EasyBuild to install software? So users themselves, are they using EasyBuild in their own account, maybe on top of what's provided centrally? Um, that's actually seemed to be increasing a lot. So the last year, this was a new question last year. That was about 35%. Now it's over 50%. So our researchers taking things into their own hands more often because we are too slow at reacting to the requests. I'm not sure. And let's see if this keeps going up, but it, that, that looks like an interesting trend to me. Yeah. <laughs> on different sides. Yeah, 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 it depends on how, maybe it's open for interpretation a bit, but yeah. Yeah, so do we, but, but then, yeah, but then they are using EasyBuild to install it in their accounts. That, that's okay, that counts, I think. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So the comment from Bart was that they're often using. Um, easy build as a way to let people install stuff themselves that they don't want to include in the central stack because it's a private installation or special configuration, something like this. And that, then they are basically producing the easy config and just handing it to the user. That That's very similar to what we do. We do a lot of that as well. Yeah. Same. And probably the same one. Yeah, Lumi is also the same in that. Yeah. But it's an interesting, it's an interesting trend. Yeah. Um, the easy build mailing list, yeah, is still there. Interest, there. so this this was also a bit interesting. Um, so more people are are passive on the mailing list; they're only reading posts for to the extent that stuff is still being posted there. But there's there's an increasing trend in people that say I should join. So it's like people who are there are passive or not using it, and other people are oh I'm not on the mailing list I should be there, and it's it, that that's very strange to me. Anyway, the mailing list is still there; it's still active. It's not as active as it was before, but it's still an important communication channel. We, we should definitely not get rid of it. We should not fully replace it by Slack um, and we should keep using it. Traffic is going down. There's a big Slack effect there. It's going down quite steeply. 
Is it gonna be disappear at some point? Maybe, but we still have 300 people there who hasn't who haven't unsubscribed. So um, Slack has become the the main hub of communication. Um, so more most people are on there. Only about a third of them are actually actually actively engaging in discussion. So many people are just either not paying attention or only reading stuff. That's also important to realize. If you ask a question there, two thirds of people are never going to answer because maybe maybe they re read the question but they don't feel like answering at all. And if you combine those two, about a fifth of the I say easy build community, but a fifth of the people filling out the survey are not on a mailing list or not on Slack. And that's also, again, important to realize. Yeah, activity in Slack has been going up steadily. We have over 700 people there now. I'm not sure when we're going to hit 1,000, but I guess that means another form of party. I don't know. I don't know how you do a party in Slack. But we can figure it out by then. Um, so if you're not there yet, it's very easy to join. Then looking at... Um, other tools that people use in combination with EasyBuild, um, there's environment modules, which is a hard dependency for EasyBuild still, and that's probably not going to change anytime soon. Um, LMOT is by far the most popular environment modules tool. Um, LMOT 8 is. LMOT 7 is slowly going down as it should be. The last release of LMOT 7 was, help me out, Simon? 2019. So it's yeah about, let's say, three and a half years old. So please stop using it. Um, it probably works fine, and the fixes that are that were added in LMOT 8 or the new features that were implemented there, maybe you don't care about them, but it's not a good idea to, to keep relying on that. And we actually may stop supporting LMOT 7 soon. Simon is going to briefly talk about that um, this afternoon. Um, there's another um, implementation of environment tool environment modules as well, which is fully tickle-based. It's basically totally unused in the EasyBuild community. Um, one painful detail there, the version 3.2. something, last release is probably 10 years ago, is still the most popular tickle-based version uh, of the environment modules tool. So compared to LMOT, it's absolutely nowhere. But that may be very specific to the easy build community because it, LMOT is the default modules tool for easy build. Um, other tools beyond environment modules, there's a long list. I'm not going to go through all of them in detail. Uh, there's a couple of interesting things here. Um, Aptainer is picking up a lot of speed. So over 40% of people are using that in combination with EasyBuild to some extent. Um, about a quarter of the people are also using Conda. So I, I've never got an answer to this, but how do people combine software installed with Conda and software installed with EasyBuild? You run into lots of trouble no? So what are they using Conda for? Um, if anyone knows or if anyone is doing that, I would like to hear your, your thoughts on that. Yeah, Bart. Yeah, so there, there's actually a Conda easy block where you can um, where you can use EasyBuild to install something using Conda and then get a module for it. Yeah, so there, there are things like this that, that you can do. Yeah. Okay, so for standalone stuff, it does make sense. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it does make sense for standalone stuff that you don't want to combine with other things. That, that does make sense. And if it's there and it works, then why go through the effort of, yeah. Okay. Um, there's also a steady increase of people using certain VMFS, probably to park their software installations on. That that makes a lot of sense. That's what's being used in the Easy Project. That's what's being used at at the. Uh, I still want to say Compute Canada, but I should say the Digital Research Alliance. Yada yada. Um, so that's that's very interesting that that's increasing, and it's it's a difficult tool, a difficult project to understand why you want to use it. But once it clicks. I think it's very easy to be convinced and, and then start looking into it. Um, there's still a small and stable minority, about 8%. It's been pretty stable over the years that uses both EasyBuild and SPAC. And then there's new stuff. Um, I added these because either we have talks about it um, or because some people ask. There's open on demand. That's about 
of people using it. Very interesting project. We're also using it in Ghent. There's a talk about this tomorrow, I think, by James. Uh, and there's the Easy Project as well, which is only 10%. So that's also important to know. There's some overlap between Easy and Easy Build, but it's currently relatively small. So more on Easy. I'm not going to steal Kaspar's thunder here. Um, he has a de dedicated talk on this. Um, the interesting message here, Easy Build is only a very small part of the Easy Project, but there is quite a bit of overlap um, between the Easy Build community and Easy. Currently, only about a quarter of the Easy Build community has hands-on experience with Easy, so they people who actually played with it. That's a reasonably good number, um, but it could be a lot higher. Um, and one very important detail, but Casper will mention this as well, is that we, there's now a dedicated, there's a funded project, the Euro HPC project, um, where part of the money is actually being used to uh, make easy build, uh, make easy, sorry, um, uh, a project that you can start relying on to, to, to make it stable, to make it production ready. Um, easy build releases, yeah, the, the frequency of that has been going down a little bit over the years, but people are way more happy now than they were before. I'm actually not very happy with that. I don't think we're pushing out stuff quickly enough, but everybody else thinks it's okay. So maybe I should I should be in the same boat. Um, and then contributors, ah, oh, this, this, oh, yeah, it's a PDF, it's not gonna work. Uh, that's another tradition. I always include this GIF of, of the Microsoft people having a party over God knows what. Um, so contributions to Easy Build Framework, that's going up and down a bit, depending on, on um, the type of work we're doing. I could imagine in 2023, it's gonna uh, increase again a bit with Easy Build 5 that we're currently working on. Um, there was a big peak in 2019 when we did the porting to Python 3. Uh, and the good news here is over half of the pull requests being done here are not me or anyone in the HPC UGAN team. So other maintainers or outside contributors. For Easy Blocks, it's a bit similar. Um, it looks like we've done a lot less work in 2022 in Easy Blocks. I'm not sure why. Maybe there was just less stuff to do. Um, but we still do have over 30 unique contributors. That's not shown in the graph, but it's 30 different people um, working on, on Easy Blocks. And over 70% of the pull requests there are coming from people outside HPC UGAN team. Or even over a third of that are from people who are who are not an easy build maintainer, and I think that's a good uh, that's a good sign. For easy configs, um, last year we were very 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 close to breaking the two and a half thousand pull requests per year, which is huge. So if you count in terms of pull requests per working day, it's about ten pull requests you're getting in that you have to work yourself through. Um, I would say luckily last year it was a little bit less. We got about 10% less pull requests. Um, there's a couple of factors there. Um, we have a big backlog of open pull requests. I'll show that in a bit. Uh, we were quite late with uh, defining the 2022B tool chain. So we had less pull requests, I think, because of that. There's an easy effect there as well. People were busy with easy, so they had less time to open pull requests probably. Um, and there's yeah, lots of things combined. So I don't think this is something to really worry about. We've been having 2,000 pull requests a year for several years now, and that's that's more than enough, more than enough to keep us busy. Um, who are merging those pull requests? So this is more of a maintainer view on the left, at least. Um, so I'm less and less involved in merging pull requests and easy config pull requests, which is a good thing, because if you look at uh, 2016, for example, I was doing close to 1500 pull requests by myself, which is absolutely insane. Uh, and that's where, when I really started realizing we need active maintainers and help from additional people um, uh, processing contributions. Things have been improving a lot uh, over the last couple of years. Um, what's not so nice is that we're keeping pull requests, more pull requests open. Um, so the backlog of open pull requests is increasing. Um, a big chunk, I think it's about 15% of pull requests open in 2022 are still open, so haven't been closed or merged. Uh, so that's that's not very good. And the graph on the right shows um, how pull requests are opened. We have GitHub integration in EasyBuild, where you can make a pull request straight from the EasyBuild command line. 
you don't need to run any Git commands. You don't need to click around on GitHub. Easyboot will do all that for you and basically lowers the bar quite a bit to open a pull request. And to some extent, that explains the big increase that we've seen um, in the last couple of years. This is an overview on the backlog of open easy configs. You can see in 2021, 2022, we haven't really been doing, let's say, a very good job um, of keeping up with incoming pull requests. So this gives a bit of a, uh, a wrong view. If you keep in mind that we're getting more than 2,000 pull requests a year, currently having 800 pull requests open in total is not that bad, but it's still a lot, right? It's a big number and it, it does cause some trouble. Um, the good thing is we've been keeping it at around 800 for a while now, a couple of months. It's not increasing further. So at least we're, again, keeping up with incoming pull requests, but we were not able yet to work away the backlog. Um, so that's something we'll, ha we'll have to work on. Older stuff is less relevant, but these things have to actively be cleaned up, and it's, it's a lot of work. Um, I think a part of the reason here is the easy project. So this is like a negative effect of the easy project. People... Several maintainers were busy with the easy project, including myself. And that means there was less time to look at incoming contributions. Uh, so that's not okay. And yeah, we'll need a way um, to figure that out. Hopefully next year, I can show um, an updated graph where it's going down again in terms of backlog. We'll see if that happens. Uh, this is an overview of the number of unique contributors where we'll be, we've been having over the years. So different people opening pull requests. In easy configs, uh, we're now over 380 different people who have opened a pull request um, for easy configs over the year. For framework and easy blocks, it's a lot lower, but it's still good numbers, well over 100 uh, in both cases. Uh, what's interesting here, 50 uh, contributors last year were totally new, had never opened a pull request before um, to easy build. That's good. There's influx of new people. That also means these people are maybe not familiar yet with the policies that we have um, in our central easy conflicts repository. So again, you have to keep people informed or you're, you're working with new people and you're processing their contribution. That can be a bit of work. Uh, that's also visible here. Um, so this is unique contributors per year. So last year we had over a hundred and, uh, well, almost 130 unique, so 130 different people opening a pull request to easy configs. That means the maintainers have to talk to more people to process all these contributions, which to some extent means more work. And if you know that 50 of those people are entirely new to the project, that combination uh, basically makes the work of the maintainers a bit more difficult. So yeah, all, everything combined, it all makes sense. It all adds up, I think. Um, I will just, yeah, we need to figure out good ways to, to deal with that. And the last question, or at least the last question where you get to score something, is the overall quality of easy build. People are still very happy um, with the project. Uh, we have one person who's, well, one, maybe two per people who said could be better. That's maybe someone from the SPAC community filling out the survey to see what's going on. Um, but over the course of over the years, we've we haven't had a lot of negative um, negative feedback there. Author of CMake, yeah, yeah. It could be as well. Now, there's also a lot of bias here as well, of course. If you really hate easy build, there's just no way you're going to fill out the survey. So we shouldn't, we shouldn't um, over overestimate uh, this. Yeah. There, is an, there is an option pretty bad in the survey. Nobody has ever picked that one. So even the SPAC people are maybe a bit friendly to, to easy build as well. Okay, then goals and challenges. This is very short. It's all on, on a single slide. Um, uh, we're always short on time to do stuff. We're very bad at planning ahead or saying by two months, we'll get that done. That's very difficult. Um, but I, I think some of the things we'll have to do in, in the coming year is catch up on the backlog of easy config PRs and keep up with incoming contributions, not only for easy configs, but also framework, easy blocks. Um, so that when people do something very, very big, very complicated, um, yeah, keep, keep, Stay on top of that, essentially. Um, Easy Build 5 is coming up, so we're hoping to uh, release that by the end of the year. There's a lot of information there in Simon's talk, which I'm not going to spoil. Um, again, this is a very rough timeline by the end of the year. We'll see if we'll actually make it, and maybe three months earlier, 
Um, I'm not sure. It depends a bit on, on how much stuff we'll, we'll be shoving into that. Um, there's a new feature, Easy Stack Files, which has been around for a while, which has experimental support, which we would really like to stabilize so you can start relying on it and stop uh, changing its behavior. So the reason it's experimental, because you, we want to be able to turn this thing upside down still and totally change the behavior like we did in Easy Build 4.7. Um, but I think what we have now is, is pretty okay. It works quite well. We just need to trim off the rough edges and then make it stable. Um, there's probably also still a bit of work to be done uh, on Easy Build in the scope of the Easy project. So in Easy, we're building in a kind of separate or kind of special build environment where we have our path linking, where we're building on top of the compat layer, which means we're uh, we need to find libraries in a different place uh, where we're filtering filtering a lot of dependencies that are usually installed with Easy Build, but there we don't want to for different reasons. Um, and yeah, there's, there's probably things we can improve there quite a bit, also in terms of testing. Um, and for testing, yeah, like I showed, we'll, we'll have to start worrying about um, RHEL 9 or anything RHEL 9 based. Um, Ubuntu is relevant enough that we should actually be testing there as well. We're still stuck with CentOS 7, probably for another year or two. So we're already testing in, in different places, but that could probably improve quite a bit. Um, so maybe we should be doing that. Different CPUs, ARM is going to be very hard to ignore very soon. Um, it may already be there. Um, we're already doing some testing there, but maybe not enough. Um, and different easy build configurations, easy is one of them uh, we should also be testing in. So finding like a, a good combination of these things, uh, maybe we should only be testing with easy on ARM and like a special uh, test environment that combines lots of things. I'm not sure how to organize that. Uh, we should probably doing, be doing more of that. Yeah, and that's all I have. And I hope we can do a couple of questions at least. We're slowly going into the coffee break. Coffee is probably waiting for us, but yeah. Do we have any questions? Yeah, I'll just, re yeah, I'll just repeat. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so Ubuntu is important because there's a lot of investments being done in that by by AI AI community or people with lots of GPUs. Yeah. Yeah. Puts a lot of effort into make that sure that well. I mean, given the given that that community have started to invest in Ubuntu in terms of speed and cycle, mm -hmm. so Nvidia is meeting them there. Yeah, yeah. So Nvidia is doing a lot of stuff at Ubuntu. Yeah, yeah. It's the snowball effect. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay, so Ubuntu is something we shouldn't be ignoring because we're going to be missing out on a lot of, let's say, market share, especially of the, of the bigger fish and people who are work closely with the video. Yeah, yeah. Well, we, we also want to get we also want to get contributions from people who are very experienced yeah. like this. Yeah. So if we don't, yeah, if we don't have good support there. Yeah. Maybe. There's some discussion going on. It's probably difficult to follow for the remote people, but uh, yeah. We should um, check that coffee break as well. Does anyone have any any other questions? I'll be around the whole week. You can, you can bother me at any time.
and uh, that's absolutely fine.